Howdy, friends. You're listening to How the West Was Cast, a podcast dedicated to the best of the Western movie genre. Sometimes I get the sense you don't care for me much, Miss Tethero. Oh, I have no feelings one way or the other, Mr. Meek. That, 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 that's just a kind way of saying you don't like me. I don't like where we are. So that's what you think, that we're lost? I'd say that seems about the right word for it. We're not lost. We're not lost, we're just finding our way. I certainly hope so. We're going to make it all right. Oh, you don't need to patronize me, Mr. Meek. Well, that, now, well, now I think you're flirting with me, ma'am. You don't know much about women, do you, Stephen Meek? That was a scene from Kelly Reichardt's Western drama, Meek's Cutoff one of several recent films that you'll hear about on this special bonus episode of How the West Was Cast. Hello, my name is Matthew Chernoff, and I'm a screenwriter and an entertainment journalist in Los Angeles. And I'm Andrew Patrick Nelson, a film historian and the chair of the Department of Film and Media Arts at the University of Utah. So for this episode, we're doing something a little bit different. Rather than discuss one film, we're instead presenting a lecture titled Western Movies Today, History, Criticism, Production, delivered by our very own Andrew Patrick Nelson. The talk was recorded in front of a live audience at the Museum of the Rockies Hager Auditorium in Bozeman, Montana. It took place on December 2, 2019, and was part of Montana State University's Perspectives on the American West Lecture Series. Now, if you've listened to some of our other episodes, you've probably heard us mention Andrew's book, Still in the Saddle, which covers the Hollywood Westerns from 1969 until 1980. Well, some of the things you'll hear on today's show are ideas that might end up being explored in a planned sequel to that book, this time focused on Westerns made between 1981 and 2020. And with that said, we hope you enjoy this bonus episode of How the West Was Cast. Hi, everyone. Thank you to Professor Susan Colleen for the invitation, to the Ivan Doig Center for hosting, and especially to all of you for coming out tonight. It's very good to be back in Bozeman. So I'm going to talk about Western movies tonight. Who here likes Western movies? Do you like the, the Western movies? Okay. All right. We'll start with some audience participation. Favorite Western movies? Just yell them out. Shane. Shane. McCabe and Mrs. Miller. I heard Rio Bravo. Any, anything else? Django and Shane. Okay. Thelma and Louise, not a Western. <laughs> I heard Django over there. Anyone else? Little Big Man. I like that. Who, what, what else we got? She wore a yellow ribbon. Good choice. Anyone else? The Searchers. The searchers. That's the correct answer. <laughs> okay. So we've got a knowledgeable audience here, here this evening, right? Lover, lovers of Westerns, which is great. Has anyone seen any good Westerns lately? <laughs> there we go. No? Wind River, not a Western. Okay. <laughs> The Sisters Brothers. There we go. Thank you. That's going to help me later on. It's hard. Right? It's hard, it's hard to, to name a Western that was good that you've... Christian Bale. That one with Christian Bale. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Well, here's a few of them up here. So on the screen before us is a selection of Westerns that were released over the past decade, starting in 2010 with True Grit and kind of bookended on the other end by The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, which came out last year, and also a Coen Brothers movie. Now, these are not all of the Westerns of the past decade, but they are, for the most part, the best known. They all played in cinemas, although the majority received limited, and in some cases, very limited, theatrical releases. And that's why I'd wager many of you have never heard of some or maybe even most of these movies. But the fact that you like Westerns but haven't heard about these movies, don't know of their existence, is actually beside the point. Now, how could that be? How could that be beside the point? What do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. Of these 14 films up on the screen, I would argue that there are two that stand out as unlike the others. But which two? Think about it for a second. If you had to pick two that were alike but also unlike the other ones up there, which ones would you pick? 
These are the two that I would pick, The Lone Ranger and The Magnificent Seven. Now, what do these two movies have in common, you ask? Well, yes, they are both remakes, but then so is True Grit from 2010. And I have not included True Grit from 2010 in my grouping of things that aren't like the others, things that just don't belong. So what criterion am I using? Any thought? Blockbusters. There we go. Was that, was that you, John? Yeah. All right. Awesome. <laughs> it's a former student of mine, so that explains why he was able to give the correct answer. These films are designed to make money. The Lone Ranger and The Magnificent Seven were both consciously crafted to be box office hits. The Lone Ranger was Disney's final attempt at replicating the success of the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. Do you remember those movies? Yeah. Now, that was a franchise that, unlike most of Disney's early 21st century offerings, appealed primarily to boys. After failing to accomplish the feat of replicating that success with the fantasy video game adaptation Prince of Persia, Sands of Time, and also failing to do so with the science fiction Edgar Rice Burroughs adaptation, John Carter, the studio, Disney, looked for yet another masculine property to adapt. It settled on The Lone Ranger and went so far as to enlist Pirates of the Caribbean 1, 2, and 3, director Gore Verbinski, and to cast pirate star Johnny Depp as Tonto. But it didn't work. The Lone Ranger was a notorious flop. Disney then acquired Marvel and Star Wars, obviating the need to develop any of its own male-centric properties forever. <laughs> the Magnificent Seven similarly sought to combine elements from recent popular films within the framework of an existing Western property. In this case, John Sturgis's 1960 Western, The Magnificent Seven, itself based on Akira Kurosawa's The Magnificent Seven. Now, Denzel Washington is, of course, one of the finest actors of his generation. But, like other aging male stars of his generation, most notably Liam Neeson, Washington has begun to alternate his more serious roles with surprisingly popular action movies like The Equalizer, which are about ordinary appealing older men who are in fact lethal assassins. <laughs> it's a great genre. <laughs> the Magnificent Seven's second star, Chris Pratt, shot to fame playing Chris Pratt in The Guardians of the Galaxy, Lego Movie, and Jurassic World movies. Yet even the combination of Jerry Action Denzel. <laughs> yes, yes. I wish I could take credit for coining that, but I can't. So even the combination of uh, Denzel, Silent Assassin, works at the hardware store, and <laughs> Rex Danger Vest uh, was not enough to make The Magnificent Seven a hit. Unlike those two films, the other westerns up on the screen were not designed to break records at the box office. Now, that's not to say some of them weren't successful financially, but financial success was not the goal. So why were they made? Given that so few Westerns are now produced, and given that, as The Lone Ranger and The Magnificent Seven suggest, audiences who would otherwise turn out for action films with popular stars stay away from Westerns, why would anyone make a Western today? Now, the critic, Scott Eyman, came close to answering this question in 2014. Assessing the current state of Western movie making, he wrote, quote, the genre is more or less dead, except when a powerful director or star gets an urge to make a vanity Western. Hmm. Now, the bluntness of that statement, with its invocation of death and vanity, is sure to raise the ire of any fan of the Western but we would have to admit that there is a great deal of truth to it. Put more charitably, we might say that Westerns are now made to win awards. This is a relatively new development, and it marks a pronounced shift from the heyday of the Western, when now celebrated films earned big box office, but limited critical acclaim. From the late 1930s to the mid-1960s, the Western was the most popular movie genre in America, with hundreds of titles released annually. Now, of these, only 10 
were nominated for the Academy Award for Best Picture, and none won. So that means that a Western had less than a one-tenth of one percent chance of simply being nominated for Best Picture at a time when the Western saturated American popular culture to a degree that you needed to experience in order to fully appreciate. I could give you another example. That would be the career of the director John Ford. No other major filmmaker identified himself so closely with the Western. And in the public mind, the association between Ford and the Western is so close that one can seem to merge into the other. And how could it not? The man made stagecoach, my darling Clementine, the searchers, and the man who shot Liberty Valance, to name but four of his Westerns. Now, John Ford did win four Academy Awards, for Best Director, which is a record that still stands to this day. But they were awarded to serious films, that is to say, non-Western films, The Informer, The Grapes of Wrath, How Green Was My Valley, and The Quiet Man. So what changed? Since the early 1990s, when Dances with Wolves and Unforgiven both won the Best Picture Oscar, mainstream Western film production has been characterized by serious works, intended less to attract large audiences than to garner awards and critical acclaim. The average Western today premieres at an international film festival like Cannes before it arrives at a theater near you, if it ever arrives at a theater near you. Once a popular genre, the Western, as it appears in conventional cinematic production and reception contexts, is now a prestige genre. Moreover, when a big-screen Western is made today, it is almost always the result, as Iman suggests, of the agency and the aspiration, and in many cases, the determination, of the filmmaker or star, rather than popular interest in the genre. So Quentin Tarantino or the Coen brothers, they're powerful filmmakers who can make almost any film they want to make. Tommy Lee Jones likes Westerns. He co-wrote, co-produced, directed, and starred in The Homesman. That's commitment. Michael Fassbender co-produced and starred in Slow West. Now, that film was directed by John McClain, a name that won't be familiar to most of you. But McClain was a former musician and video, music video director whom Fassbender had been supporting and promoting in different ways for over a decade. Again, that's commitment. Now, Kurt Russell officially was only an actor in Bone Tomahawk, but he's famously hands-on in the production of his films. He was also a great admirer of the first-time director Craig S. Zaylor's two Western novels. If you look at Zaylor's first novel, there's an endorsement by Russell on the back. So, again, the agency, the aspiration, the determination of the filmmaker. And it's not to say, though, that Simply because you win an Oscar, you can automatically make a Western. It's still a, a tough road. Not every actor who wants to make their Western is as lucky as some of these other guys. So consider the case of Jane Got a Gun. Did anybody see this Western? Yeah, and a, a few folks, a few. The story behind the movie is probably more entertaining than the film itself, so why don't I share that with you now? Uh, in 2012, Natalie Portman, fresh off her Oscar-winning turn in Black Swan, decided, like many people who win an Oscar, that she wanted to make a Western. So she signed on to star in an, and produce Jane Got a Gun for a company called Relativity Media. What followed was a tumultuous year of pre-production. Both the director and the cinematographer left the project and were replaced. Michael Fassbender, originally cast as the male lead, left, and he was replaced by Joel Edgerton, who had originally been cast as the villain. Jude Law was then cast as the villain, but then he left the production, and he was replaced by Bradley Cooper, who then left, <laughs> and was replaced by Ewan McGregor. Cameras finally rolled on the film in late 2013. Now, the finished film was scheduled to be released in August of 2014, but that was pushed back to February of 2015, and then again to September. But in July of 2015, Relativity Media lost the rights to the film after the company filed for bankruptcy. The Weinstein Company, already set to release The Hateful Eight in December of 2015, opportunistically swooped in, acquired the distribution rights to Jane Got a Gun, and finally released it in January of 2016. Now, Portman 
followed the template that had been established by other stars. Make it big, win some awards, make your Western. Hers is nevertheless a cautionary tale, which illustrates the challenges of getting a movie made today. So we may wonder, fairly, why you would bother trying <laughs> to make a Western. Now, sure, Westerns are awesome. We all agree about this. And yes, Westerns are now looked upon favorably by the cinema elite. But many types of films bear a similar veneer of prestige. What is it about the Western? What does the Western offer to actors and filmmakers today? Actors and filmmakers, the vast majority of whom were born well after the genre's wane. Fair questions. Now, being roughly of the same generation of, as uh, many of the actors and directors who are now producing Westerns, I feel like I have some insight into this question. And the answer is a little complicated, though, so I want to try to get at it by way of an example. Right, how many of you have seen Meek's Cutoff when you saw this film? Okay, a few folks. So Meek's Cutoff is one of my favorite Westerns of the past decade. It was directed by Kelly Reichardt, and it was released in 2011. It also happens to be one of the most critically acclaimed Westerns released in this period, and it was especially lauded for the way that it addressed the representation of women in the West and women in the Western genre. Now, the film is based on the true story of a wagon train of 200 families bound for Oregon who in the summer of 1845, elected to leave the Oregon Trail and follow a mountain man and guide named Stephen Meek on what he claimed was a quicker alternative route that avoided the perilous Blue Mountains, which is the last mountain range that American pioneers needed to cross on their journeys west. Far from the shortcut that Meek promised, the detour through the desert ended up adding 40 days and 400 miles to the original journey and cost the lives of 23 people one of the most infamous incidents in the history of the American West. Now, Reichardt and her screenwriter, Jonathan Raymond, reduced the size of the wagon train down to Meek and three families in the movie. But the perils that the party faces crossing the punishing high desert of Oregon are in no way diminished. Now, what marks Meek's cutoff as a feminist intervention into the Western is a combination of what we see and how we see it. Rather than simply revising its portrayal of Western women in accordance with contemporary sensibilities, the film both shows us in detail the women's work that was elided from many Western narratives, and it also very cleverly aligns our experience as viewers with those of a three westbound wives. Now, this subject and approach to filming were inspired by Reichardt and Raymond's research into the history of the Oregon Trail and the role that women played in the nation's westward migration. Pioneer diaries proved especially influential to the filmmakers. It's when we began reading the diaries that we realized how little of the women's point of view was expressed on screen, Reichardt explained to Leonard Quart of Cine East magazine. The diaries also begin with big ideas and grand dreams when they start out, but as they go, the trip turns into a stripped-down, bare-bones list of chores, like pitching a tent. Now, Reichardt elected to film Meek's Cutoff in the more square 1371 aspect ratio, which is rarely seen in cinema these days, rarely seen since the advent of widescreen technology in the mid 1950s. Now, in interviews, Reichardt explained that her use of the square frame was intended to restrict the viewer's perception of the expansive desert in the same way that the bonnets worn by the women restrict their peripheral vision. The film also does things to align our experience with the women in other ways. In key moments, the sound design denies us important information. We remain with the women, straining to hear the hushed and increasingly desperate tones of their husbands huddled nearby. Now, if the film is about, as Reichardt said, the labor it takes to walk across the country and the chores involved, conveying how that labor felt was a priority. A minority of reviewers have decried Meek's cutoff as, quote, tedious and boring, but even they had to concede that this was precisely the point of the movie, because that's what it was to be a pioneer. Now, when asked by court if she was consciously working against the Western conventions we associate with John Ford and Howard Hawks, Reichert responded by lamenting, quote, how Westerns are so macho and masculine, their collections of heightened moments... 
She makes a similar point about the connection between masculinity and elsewhere in other interviews. There are a lot of Westerns that I like, except the macho element gets so tiresome, Reicher told the New York Times. These constant, completely heightened moments, as if that's all a day is, moments of confrontation where people outman themselves, that part of the Western is not interesting to me. The reinscription then of the dreary historical experiences of women into an otherwise familiar Western scenario, that of the wagon train, is what produces this de-dramatization. Now, Reichardt's interviews are peppered with references to older Westerns. And on first pass, these references both signal her knowledge about the genre and accentuate what it is that her movie is doing differently than older Westerns. Consider this widely reproduced quote from an interview with The Guardian. I always wondered what, say, John Wayne and the Searchers must have looked like to the woman cooking his stew. This comment very succinctly conveys her aim to show us the female perspectives and the female labor that had been omitted from earlier Western movies. Now, I have to wonder, though, which woman in The Searchers is Reichardt referring to here? Have you seen The Searchers, most of you? Yeah. Okay. So which woman is she talking about? Which scene does she have in mind? There's no stew cooking scene, per se, in the movie. Does she mean Carmen, who serves Marty a plate of beans after he and Ethan unexpectedly come upon Mose Harper in Mexico? Or perhaps she means Ethan's, uh, excuse me, Marty's Indian wife look, who Ethan sarcastically asks for a cup of coffee. Is she thinking of Mrs. Jorgensen or her daughter, Lori? Or is Reichardt instead making a more general or perhaps generic point about the role of women in the Western? Now, absent a follow up question, it's hard to say. But the suggestion that we come away from the searchers not knowing how the many women around him perceive John Wayne's character, Ethan Edwards, is certainly debatable. After all, The Searchers is a film, the very first shot of which is not from the perspective of a man, but of a woman looking at John Wayne. So The Searchers is, in fact, a film that from the very outset asks us, what does John Wayne look like to a woman? The film also contains many subsequent shots that emphasize women looking terrified at John Wayne's character. Hmm. Now, should we expect directors to have an encyclopedic knowledge of the genres in which they traffic, the knowledge of a film historian? <sighs> no, 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 of course we shouldn't. And any contemporary filmmaker like Reichardt who can reference excellent but non-canonical films like Yellow Sky, as Reichardt does in several interviews, has no doubt seen her share of Westerns. Yet the overall impression, fair or not, is that Reichardt's understanding of the Western, or perhaps her conception of the Western, is of the type one gains from a basic college film class, centered not only on canonical films, but canonical interpretations of them, emphasizing ideas like the Western functioning as an American mythology that glossed over historical truths. The Western staging an opposition between civilization and savagery. The Western hero straddling the divide between those two. Or how the Western deals with themes of race and gender, and especially how the Western promoted an ideology based on the subjugation of Indians and a subordination of women. Right. Those of you who got here a little bit earlier saw that I put some quotes up on the board from introductory film textbooks that articulate these very ideas. Those ideas originated in very sophisticated scholarship, but over time they're distilled down to more introductory level material. And then they become widespread ideas that we hold in the popular culture. They shape our understanding of the Western. They shape the understanding of the Western of even those who have never seen one. So in a sense... What was once description, a critical act, becomes prescription, what you're supposed to do when you make art of this type. Now, Reichardt is certainly not alone in her academic understanding of the Western. Scott Cooper, the screenwriter and director of 2017's Hostiles, another film I quite like, 
also references numerous older westerns in interviews about his movie. He describes Hostiles, for example, as a psychological western in the vein of Anthony Mann. That is a learned opinion about the western. When asked, though, in Movie Maker magazine whether he was inspired by John Ford, Cooper replied, certainly I was inspired by him, even though in a lot of those films, a lot of men wore black hats and a lot of men wore white hats. Native Americans were portrayed in a certain way, and the white saviors were portrayed in a certain way. Most Westerns don't really deal in those kind of shades of ambiguity. They're much more starkly black and white. I love moral ambiguity and moral complexity. Now, anyone who has seen any of John Ford's Westerns is likely to take issue with this statement. The suggestion that Ford's Westerns lacked moral ambiguity and moral complexity is frankly preposterous. And I could point to an example of nearly any of Ford's Westerns, but I'll give you one that you probably haven't seen. So that was the opening of a film called Hellbent, which John Ford made in 1917, 100 years before Hostiles was released. Now, until this year, a good English language version of the film uh, did, did not exist, which explains why it's in German, but you all read German, so it's not a problem. <laughs> uh, I'll help you out a little bit. So we have a writer who receives a note from his editor. His editor tells him that the public doesn't want Western stories with characters who are all good or all bad because those people don't exist. Contemplating this call for what we might call ambiguity and complexity, the writer finds inspiration in a print of Frederick Remington's The Misdeal, and he proceeds to imagine the story that follows. In 1917, so from the beginning of his career then, John Ford clearly, consistently, and repeatedly rejected the idea that Westerns were simplistic tales of white hats versus black hats, and yet that conception of the Western persists. Now, in certain respects, film criticism in the broad sense, so I include myself in this, is equally, if not more, at fault for such mischaracterizations. Reading interviews with contemporary Western filmmakers brings to mind interviews conducted with John Ford in the 1960s. Now, occasionally, Ford would discuss his Westerns in relation to the great Western artists who preceded him, describing, for example, his attempts to capture the color and the movement of Frederick Remington, and she wore a yellow ribbon, or using a Charlie Russell motif in The Searchers. Never once was Ford, who knew these artists intimately and who knew Russell personally, ever asked a follow-up question. Perhaps this was because interviewers were intimidated being in the presence of Ford. More likely, it was because they didn't know what he was talking about just as it is likely that those charged with questioning Reichard and Cooper about their engagement with the Western's history and conventions didn't have the knowledge to probe them about their references and influences or to even make plausible claims of their own about their movies. I'll give you an example. In the preface to his interview with Reichardt in Cine East magazine, Leonard Court emphasizes how different Meek's cutoff is from earlier Westerns, asserting, quote, that her wagon train carries no echoes of a film like John Ford's Wagon Master, Wagon Master being a film also about a wagon train. So no echoes. So that's the end of Wagon Master and the beginning of Meek's Cutoff. Gives you a good sense of the style of Meek's Cutoff for those of you who haven't seen it. So no echoes. Do you see any echoes? Was there an echo? Perhaps. Perhaps there was an echo. Uh, If anything... Meek's cutoff explicitly echoes Wagon Master in multiple ways. It could even be seen as a dark mirror to, Forbes opt- to John Ford's optimistic, which was uncharacteristic for that period in his career, vision of westward expansion. As we see, Wagon Master concludes with a triumphant river crossing by a wagon train of pious pioneers, while Meek's cutoff, as if in response, shows us the ominous fate that awaits the group on the opposite bank. Now, I'd like to believe that Reichardt knew what she was doing here. But so far as I've been able to find, she was not once asked about Wagon Master. Seems odd. Now, like with Ford and his influences, unasked questions have consequences for our understanding of the Western. At worst, the discourse around a particular contemporary Western can perpetuate stereotypes about older movies. 
and impoverish the history of America's greatest movie genre. Meeks cut off and hostiles were widely described as revisionist westerns on the same grounds as nearly every other acclaimed western since at least the late 1960s, including historical accuracy, the destruction of naive myths, the restoration and elevation of the role of minorities in western history, and a liberal commentary on contemporary politics. A paragraph from Mark Olson's review in the Los Angeles Times offers a succinct example. Quote, Meeks cut off as a revisionist Western richly layered to consider the emergence of women's role in society, divisions of class, and a nascent concern for Native peoples, as well as a bracing parable of what happens when one enters the desert with an uncertain leader. Okay. Nearly the exact same thing, of course, was said of films like Little Big Man and McCabe and Mrs. Miller over 40 years before. And now, as then, critics often take their interpretive lead from filmmakers. Just as director Arthur Penn in 1970 was quick to speak of Little Big Man in relation to Vietnam, so did Reichardt and Cooper discuss their films in relation to contemporary events. For Reichardt, it was the Iraq War. Quote, it's an allegory for so much of what's happening right now. When these wagon trains started out, they would hire people as pilots, and then they created these laws they had to follow and a hierarchy to enforce it. For Cooper... It was race relations. Quote, hostiles allows me to speak to what's happening in America today in terms of race. The racial divide in our country is widening. We're living in polarized times, and I wanted to speak to this nation that we need to reconcile and better understand one another. I think America needs to heal. My character's journey from New Mexico to Montana becomes an enlightenment. I wanted to speak to what I see as an America looming down a dark and dangerous path. Now, it's difficult not to contrast such pretentious posturing with the taciturn disposition of John Ford, who was willing to let his films speak for themselves. Monument Valley. John Ford has shot nine movies here. It's become so identified with him, other directors are convinced that using it as a location would be plagiarism. Surely this would be the place most conducive to getting Mr. Ford's own thoughts on his craft and art. Eleven, take one. Take one? There's more, more, more than one take, will I? Shoot. Mr. Ford, you made a picture called Three Bad Men, which was a large-scale western. You had a quite elaborate land rush in it. Mm-hmm. How did you shoot that? With a camera. <laughs> Isn't the Sunshine's Bride kind of a little picture that you made for yourself? Would that yeah. fall in the same? Uh-huh. Mr. Ford, I've noticed that the uh, that your view of the West has become increasingly sad and melancholy over the years. Uh, I'm comparing, for instance, Wagon Master to the man who shot Liberty Valance. Have you been aware of that change no. in mood? No. Now that I've pointed out, is there anything you'd like to say about it? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Can I ask you what, what particular element about the Western appealed to you from the beginning? I wouldn't know. Would you agree that the point of uh, Fort Apache was that uh, tradition, the tradition of the Army, was more important than one individual? Cut. Now, to be fair to Kelly Reichardt and Scott Cooper, in the interviews I quoted, they're saying the sorts of things that they're expected to say. Beyond the features that I mentioned earlier, perhaps the prevailing idea about the Western is that the genre is supposed to be a vehicle for talented filmmakers to continuously and progressively comment upon American history, culture, and politics. Again, that the, the Western is a myth of American society. What I worry about is how these prevailing ideas, which are now shared between filmmakers and film critics and scholars, as well as a wider audience, will impact our understanding of and appreciation of the genre's rich history. Western filmmakers of every age strive, however imperfectly, to come to terms with American history and to plead for tolerance and understanding. If Westerns offered mid-century audiences an escape to a mythologized past, the best of them, paradoxically, spoke very powerfully about the present, all the while offering ample doses of adventure and romance. 
While the contemporary Western retains many of its traditional iconographic, narrative, and thematic features, it is nevertheless governed, as we've seen tonight, by different forces. And as a prestige film intended for a more select and perhaps more intellectual audience, Westerns can now do certain things that films intended for popular audiences cannot. And this is on balance a good thing because while fewer Westerns may play at our local cinemas today, they have not ceased to innovate, to use the genre in new and interesting ways. Thank you. Shall, shall we take some questions, Susan? Okay. Yes, sir. What do I think of Sam Peckinpah? Well, it wouldn't be me if I didn't first pug my book, Still in the Saddle, The Hollywood Western, 1969 to 1980 which uh, contains many thoughts about Sam Peckinpah. Recently endorsed by David Morrill, who created Rambo, he actually wrote a review of my book that he said it was basically the best thing ever except for Rambo. So <laughs> I think Sam Peckinpah is the best Western filmmaker to emerge in the 1960s. Now, that's a small group of people, but he is an incredibly talented filmmaker whose influence over the Western cannot be overstated. What we tend to misunderstanding about Peckinpah is we see him as a revisionist filmmaker, somebody who was interested in shattering the candy-coated myths of earlier Western films, when that, that, of course, isn't the case. I mean, we often mistake what are simply changes in standards of verisimilitude over time for some kind of you know, political or ideological uh, shift, which isn't usually the case. What's realistic just changes over time. So what I like most about Peckinpah is he was a guy who just knew Westerns very well, who loved Westerns, who identified himself as a maker of Westerns. And that distinguishes him from people like Arthur Penn or Robert Altman, who were really keen on really, de really setting out to destroy the Western in some ways. So, so Peckinpah was great. It's unfortunate that Peckinpah's personal demons, let's say, got the better of him by the middle of the 1970s. But of course, without those demons, he might, have, he might not have made the films that he did in the 60s and 70s. But it, yeah, a great filmmaker, a great filmmaker. Wild Bunch, unquestionably one of the greatest uh, Westerns, if not one of the greatest films ever made. Other questions? Yes, sir. If you were to write a script where you went back in time and interviewed Absolutely. Yeah, I'd have my ascot on and everything, just like Bogdanovich. It would be amazing. Yeah, I think I think so, but that's only because I have the benefit of having read interviews and and, and wondering, you know, what is it that these people weren't asking? I mean, what what that gap points to is a kind of weakness in the study of Western popular culture, which, which has been historically to look at different media in isolation from one another. So to not look at film in relation to painting, um, to not look at film in relation to literature. It's not to say that that work hasn't taken place, but it's, it's, very, it's, it's very rare compared to the work that looks at media um, with, with a sole focus. And the relationship between Western art and Western film, which you, you think would be taken, you know, would, would be an obvious area of inquiry, there just has not been a lot of work done on that. And then that may be because you know, film and, and art are, are ultimately separate media, and people who study either have kind of different skill sets. But I, to me, that's, that's what that speaks to, that we, we haven't done a great job of looking at the Western sort of holistically in its popular iterations and looking at the connections between them. And I would say even, even when that, that work has been done, and that's, that work certainly has been done, Richard Slotkin is, a, is one gentleman who, who certainly does that work. A more recent person would be someone like Neil Campbell. But what I would, what, what I think that often when that happens, usually you're proposing some kind of grand overarching theory about what the West means, and then all of your examples become subordinate to that, and they kind of fit into a, a, a totalizing worldview that I don't find very persuasive. So the answer to your question is yes, I would of course do a much better job than Peter Bogdanovich at interviewing John Ford. Yeah, yeah. Great question, though. Yes, sir. So what defines a Western exactly? What defines a Western? Uh, what I say is a Western, I guess. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I get, that, I get asked that, that question a lot. And it's, it's very easy to get sidetracked down the path of, you know, is this a Western? Is this not a Western? Because if, especially if you like Westerns, you, you want to see the Western here there and everywhere. So you want to make arguments about things that aren't Westerns, perhaps being Westerns or being some kind of ancestor of the Western or being influenced by the Western or something along those lines. And I, I find those lines of inquiry interesting, but what I, what I always have a problem with 
is using the word Western to describe things that the people who were watching those things did not think of as Westerns. I have, a, I have a bit of an issue with that. So what is a Western? I mean, generally speaking, a Western is a narrative that's set between the end of the Civil War and the turn of the century, uh, west of the Mississippi, east of the Rockies. And if you use that definition, you would arrive at tens of thousands of films, the vast majority of which have not been studied uh, to, any, to any degree. So uh, that's, that's kind of where I start. And then, you know, we can, we can make arguments, I suppose, to expand the time frame or, or the geography. But I think that's, that's the place to start. Good question. Yes, sir? What television westerns stand out? Oh, geez. What television westerns stand out? Well, television westerns can stand out for different reasons. Longevity, of course, is a big one. So if you're a fan of Gunsmoke, <laughs> that, that would be one. Let's see. Television westerns that stand out. Well, from, from the 50s, I think Have Gun Will Travel, I think was actually quite interesting. I think Gunsmoke, right after it comes onto TV off of the radio, I think is pretty interesting. I really like The Big Valley, but that's because it stars Barbara Stanwyck, greatest actress who ever lived. <laughs> I, I, think that's, I think that's very good. Lonesome Dove is a TV Western. We, 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 we tend to forget that, but that was, that was on TV. Deadwood, of course, is an excellent Western series, which is really good. Those, I guess those are the ones that come to mind. The challenge with looking at the 50s and 60s is there's just, man, there's just so many of them. <laughs> there's just so many of them. The Virginian, uh, I suppose, would be one. Laramie, oh, man, they, they just go on and on. Do you want to hear a story about uh, the Virginian Laramie? Do you, do you guys know what those shows are? Okay. Right. You don't, but that's okay. This story is pretty funny. Um, <laughs> So, and, and this maybe speaks actually to something that I was talking about today. Let's say one issue that maybe looms over this presentation is, should we expect artists to be able to speak knowledgeably about their own work? Right? And it, it sounds like when I say that, well, of course, but I don't know. I mean, art criticism is a different set of skills than art making. And I think it's fair to recognize that the, a single individual is not necessarily going to be adept in both. I mean, there, there are certainly cases where they are, but... There, it's not always the case. Also, an artist is basically a professional liar. That, that's what art is, right? The, the, the best art is the one that fools us the best, the filmmaking. So why would we expect these professional liars to tell us the truth about their work, I suppose, is another question. John Ford would be a case in, case in point of that. Anyway, so last summer... I moderated these celebrity Q&As at the Western Cowboy Festival in Jubilee in Ardmore, Oklahoma, which was great. So all of the surviving cast members of Laramie were there. Bob Fuller was there. And most of the surviving cast members of The Virginian were there, uh, which, which was really interesting. So I was on a panel with, with some of these people. And one of the actors, it was, it was James Drury, who was the star of The Virginian. He was responding to, an, to a, a question from the audience about why the Virginian was so popular. And the Virginian was very popular. And he said that, I'm paraphrasing, because this is a family audience, that the Virginian was popular because it allowed people to come home at the end of the day and escape from their lives. Fine. And that, that answer actually got applause. And after the applause had died down, I interjected as the moderator, and I said, well, of course escapism is part of the Western, but... But, but surely part of the Western's appeal, particularly on television in the 1950s, was the way that it confronted the very real social issues of the day in the 50s and the 60s. So if, if those of you who have watched a lot of Westerns, you'll know that almost every other episode of The Virginian or Laramie or Wagon Train or Rawhide, there's some narrative about a Native American or about a woman or about a Mexican. It, it's almost every other week there's something about some oppressed group. So I made the point that, well, surely these Westerns were relevant because they were confronting, on a weekly basis, the actual social problems that people were encountering. They were confronting racism. You know, they were confronting bigotry. They were confronting xenophobia almost, almost every week. And that did not go over well with Mr. Drury <laughs> or Mr. Fuller, for that matter. It was as if they had never thought of that before. And then one gentleman raised his hand and I called on him and he said, I watch the Virginian every night. And anyway, and, <laughs> and I just wanted to escape, you know, that kind of thing. So, so that was, it was kind of a tense moment in the proceedings. But what was interesting was that afterward, all of these women started coming up to me and saying, well, yes, of course. <laughs> right? That's of course why I watch those shows every week with my husband. It was because I saw people fighting for me. 
And also younger men were also coming up to me and saying this, but it was this really fascinating moment where you, you realize that one of the great features, let's say, qualities of American media in particular is its ambiguity, right? in that it, it doesn't hammer you over the head with a particular message, that it actually enables you to see yourself in the show, and that you could have, let's talk in stereotypes, a very conservative husband and his very liberal wife could sit down and watch the same show every week and both come out of it thinking, yes, this show is for me. That's what the Western was. And if it wasn't that, it would not have been the most popular genre in America for so long. Long answer to a short question. That was Western Movies Today. History, criticism, production. Recorded on December 2nd, 2019. Until next time, I'm Matthew Chernoff, and you've been listening to How the West Was Cast. Well, that was our show. We thank you kindly for listening, and hope you'll come back again real soon. Till then, keep your saddle oiled and your guns greased. We'll be seeing you. Ha, 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 ha.